Um, hello and welcome everybody for this week's uh, Infosys Chandrasekhar and Random Geometry Colloquium. Today we are glad to have uh, as a speaker our very own Sabir Sachi, who will give us a talk about deformation space analogies between planning and reflection groups and rational maps. So over to you, Sabir Sachi. Okay, yeah. Uh, th thanks, Shoujit, for the introduction. And well, thanks to the organizers uh, for inviting me to speak here. Okay, so um, the topic of today's talk is um, sort of some connections between um, the deformation spaces of two different classes of conformal dynamical systems. So, on one hand, we will have uh, reflection groups generated by um, or, or <coughs> Uh, <clears throat> sorry, reflection groups generated by reflections of a circle packing. So these are uh, these are called Kleinian reflection groups because they also extend to uh, reflection groups acting on the three-dimensional hyperbolic space. And the other class of dynamical systems are given by rational maps acting on the Riemann sphere. So just to get the all the terminology set. Let me start with the basic definitions of the objects that we will be talking about. Uh, so, so what is a rational map? So most of these definitions are obviously well known to everyone, but let me still go through them. So a rational map R is a map of a form of the form PZ over QZ, where P and Q are polynomials, and it acts on the Riemann sphere. So these are exactly the meromorphic maps of the Riemann sphere. <laughs> on the other hand, a Kleinian group is a discrete subgroup of PSL2C. So these are the, this is the group of Mobius automorphisms of C hat and a discrete subgroup thereof is called a Kleinian group. And um, in fact, every Kleinian group not only acts on the Riemann sphere, they can also be extended, their actions can also be extended as orientation preserving isometries of the hyperbolic three space, which you can think of it as a, you can think of it as a, as a three dimensional ball. And then the Riemann sphere is its boundary. So these guys also act. So you can think of them either as conformal automorphisms of the sphere or as orientation preserving isometries of the three space. On the other hand, um, a rational map does not really have such a nice extension to the, to the hyperbolic three space. However, there are many similarities between the dynamics of a rational map and the dynamics of Kleinian groups. So some sort of notational or terminology uh, similarity that comes from definition of the basic objects is the following. When you try to understand the dynamics of a single rational map on a Riemann sphere, the first thing you do is to understand, uh, to try to split the whole Riemann sphere into two dynamically invariant sets, meaning these are sets whose forward orbits and backward orbits stay in themselves, in, in, in the sets itself. And you want to, in order to get this um, dynamical decomposition in a meaningful way, you introduce two sets called the Fatou set and, and the Julia set. So what are the Fatou set and the Julia set of a rational map? So as the name suggests, the Fatou set is the largest open subset of the Riemann sphere where the dynamics is stable in the sense that the iterates of the map R form an equicontinuous family or a normal family. So if two points are closed now, they will sort of remain closed forever. And the Julia set is the complement. That's where the dynamics is chaotic. So you can start with two points that are closed and after some time they'll be far apart and they'll be, <clears throat> um, well, there are many other notions of chaos and all of that will happen on the Julia set. On the other side, in the world of Kleinian groups, the analog of a Fatou set is the domain of discontinuity of the Kleinian group G. This is again, you can define it exactly as, as, you, um, as you define Fatou set for rational maps, it's the largest open subset where the group thought of as complex analytic, thought of as consisting of complex analytic maps <coughs> form a normal family or uh, sort of more geometrically, it's the largest open set where the group action is properly discontinuous. So that's also where the dynamics is stable. And it, its complement is the limit set. So the Fatou set and the domain of discontinuity, these are sort of analogous objects so far as the dynamics are concerned. 
and the Julia set and the limit set are also analogous. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> I need to introduce something which will play a brief role uh, towards the end of the talk. So for a Kleinian group, as I mentioned, since the action also extends to um, all of H3, they act as orientation preserving isometries of H3 and the action is properly discontinuous. So you can take the quotient of the H3 as well as the domain of discontinuity, which is lying on the boundary on the Riemann sphere. And if you take the quotient of this by G, you get a hyperbolic tree. Well, let me just uh, not get into the definition of an orbifold. Let's just read as hyperbolic tree manifold. So the quotient of H3 by G will give you a hyperbolic tree manifold and the quotient of gamma G by G are going to give you some boundary components of this <coughs> hyperbolic tree manifold. And this, these boundary components are going to be Riemann surfaces. They are called the, the collection of these Riemann surfaces <coughs> is called the conformal boundary of this, uh, of this tree manifold. And yeah, as I mentioned earlier, for a rational map, uh, there is no such three-dimensional extension. Okay, so many of the similarities will essentially come from the action of rational maps and Kleinian groups on the Riemann sphere and, and not on the hyperbolic free space. Okay, to, um, before we talk about some deeper similarities between these two things, here are just two pictures to roughly motivate that there are similarities, at least at a level, at, at a pictorial level. So here are two pictures of Kleinian limit sets. This guy, uh, I'm not sure, I don't recall, maybe it's a Cantus set. And on the other hand, this guy is, is, a, is the Julia set of a rational map, and this is also a Cantus set. And you just see some similarity between them. And um, these are both what are called Sierpinski carpets, this guy is the limit set of a Kleinian group, and this is the Julia set of a rational map. So this is the set. The carpet is the set where the dynamics is chaotic, and the holes are the Fatu set. There, this is the region where the dynamics is tame. And you, at least you see some topological similarity between these sets. So of course, one can ask, where do these similarities come from? And there are some answers to these questions, but I'll not get into them in detail. Um, however, beyond these um, sort of superficial similarities, um, the, the real deep similarities between these two fields or the study of these two classes of dynamical systems come from what's called quasi-conformal deformation. So again, I'll not really get into the definition of a quasi-conformal map, but one can think of it this way. Um, instead of looking at a single Kleinian group, you want to look at some meaningful moduli space of Kleinian groups and you want to understand how nearby Kleinian group actions are related to the, to, the, to the initial one. And you can ask the same question about rational maps. If you have a rational map, and if you can perturb it so that you know, the dynamics does not change much, then how can you really explain the similarity between all of these different, uh, um, uh, the, the nearby dynamical systems? And it turns out that the notion of quasi-conformal deformations give you, um, it, it gives us a nice way of understanding how a map or a Kleinian group can be perturbed, <coughs> perturbed so that we also have a handle on how the dynamics is deformed. Because if you, just, if you just change a rational map algebraically, if you just perturb the coefficients or a Kleinian group, uh, if you just perturb the coefficients of the Mobius map, you don't quite see from this algebraic uh, perturbation what the dynamics is going to be like, whether the qualitative behavior of the dynamics is going to be related to the original dynamical system. But the, um, the theory of quasi-conformal deformations, deformations allows us to do that. It allows us to perturb maps and groups so that we also have a grip on um, the dynamics of the maps, of the nearby maps. Okay. Um, so there are two theorems, one in the theory of Kleinian groups and the other in the theory of um, rational maps that use essentially the same philosophy. Uh, um, the first one is called Alfors finiteness theorem. So it tells that if you have a finitely generated Kleinian group, then the action, so maybe just to motivate it a little bit. So essentially, as we said, the group G acts properly discontinuously on the domain of discontinuity, omega G. 
and it acts uh, chaotically on the limit set, which is the complement of this on the, uh, on the Riemann sphere. Similarly, the, for the rational map, the Fatu set is where the dynamics is supposed to be tame, and the Julia set is where the dynamics is chaotic. So at least up to a first approximation, you would think that maybe there's a chance of understanding the dynamics of a group on the domain of discontinuity, and there's a chance of understanding the dynamics of a rational map on its Fatu set. And indeed, it turns out to be true, and it turns out to be true uh, essentially because of these finiteness theorems. So Alfort's finiteness theorem tells us that the quotient of the, um, the domain of discontinuity by the group action is a finite collection of Riemann surfaces of finite type. So that you can completely understand the dynamics of the group action on this guy. So a Riemann surface is of finite type if it has a finite genus and finite many functions. On the other hand, um, a rational map doesn't is not a group action, so it doesn't quite make sense to talk about the quotient of the Fatu set by a rational map. But um, and the, the correct analog of the Alfort's finiteness statement, a uh, finiteness theorem in the world of rational maps is that if you take a component of the Fatu set, so for instance, in these pictures, if you take any component, say this one of the Fatu set, and look at the, the rational map acting on it, then you can ask, well, will the dynamics of the rational map on this Fatu set going to be sort of forever wondering, uh, is, is this component going to go to that one, then that one, then that one, and never come back to itself? Or is there going to be any cyclic pattern ever, or all of these components are going to be different from each other? Because if they're all different from each other, the dynamics will be harder to control. But Sullivan's no wandering domain theorem tells us that if you take any Fatu component, um, so yeah, a, a component of the Fatu set is referred to as a Fatu component. So uh, given any Fatu component, if you look at the iterates of, of the uh, Fatu component D and the, the rational map, it eventually falls into a cycle. And once something falls into a cycle, you, there are classical techniques from complex analysis to understand the dynamics on such periodic components. Okay, um, and these theorems, um, other than this, classification of dynamics, they also connect um, the deformation spaces of Kleinian groups and the deformation spaces of ras rational maps to deformation spaces or what are known as Teichmuller spaces of surfaces. Um, also, there are other similarities um, between Kleinian, the action of Kleinian groups and, uh, and rational dynamics. Uh, so there are three theorems of Thurston that in many ways have uh, interconnections, at least these two theorems, uh, the hyperboli hyperbolization theorem of Thurston's hyperbolization theorem for some suitable three manifolds has um, philosophy, a lot of philosophical connections with this theorem over here, which says, so what, firstly, what does, a, well, what does hyperbolization tell us? It, tell us? it gives us a topological data of a three manifold and it tells us whether we can geometrize it, whether we can put a hyperbolic metric on it. Uh, this theorem of Thurston, which is known as the topological classification of rational maps among branched covers of the, of the two sphere, it essentially tells us the following. If you have a branched covering of the Riemann sphere with some additional condition on the critical points, you require the critical points to have finite orbits, but such maps are kind of ubiquitous. So just take a topological branched cover of S2, and then Thurston asks, under what circumstance, under what condition can I geometrize this map? In the sense, when is it really equivalent to a rational map of the Riemann sphere? And he answers that in this theorem. So these two theorems, the hyperbolization theorem and the Thurston classification of uh, topological classification of rational maps among all branched covers are also related, although the proofs are quite different. Uh, the first one uses a lot of three-dimensional, uh, three-manifold, uh, three-dimensional hyperbolic geometry. Whereas the second one, the second one, the proof in some sense is related to the Nielsen-Thurston classification of homeomorphisms of, uh, of surfaces. Okay, right. So I forgot to say, please uh, I mean, read the title of the slide. So all these similarities usually go by the name of the Fatu Sullivan Dictionary. So Fatu actually observed some basic similarities between the Julia and, and the limit sets of rational maps and Kleinian groups. And Sullivan um, gave a proof of the no wandering domain theorem and a new proof of 
Alcor's finiteness theorem using the theory of quasi conformal deformation. Okay, um, yeah, so, so more similarities have been found um, in the last 30 years or so. So these, the, um, many of these similarities, I mean, this is from the 80s. This is, I mean, the, all of these are from the 80s. Right, so I'll quickly go over these points. So there have been attempts to put the dynamics of a group, of a Kleinian group or a function group and the dynamics of a complex polynomial on the same Riemann sphere so as to get a hybrid dynamical system. Um, uh, there have been work on relating combinatorial models for three manifolds and, and rational maps or Kleinian groups and rational maps. Uh, so yeah, so the first work in this direction was done by Bullock and Penrose and later on uh, Bullock and Lomonaco extended this and um, well, with, um, well, okay, I'll not read all the names. Um, uh, there's also the work of Kevin Pilgrim who proved a decomposition theorem for rational maps, which can be thought of as an analog of the Torah's decomposition theorem for three manifolds. So given a th three manifold, you can cut along Tori to get into, to sort of break it up into simpler pieces and Pilgrim proved a similar theorem for uh, post-critically finite rational maps, where you take the action of, this, of the map on the Riemann sphere and sort of split the Riemann sphere into a bunch of tree of spheres and try to understand the dynamics into all of, in, uh, all of these tree of, trees of spheres. Um, but there are also differences. So, and it's expected that there will be some differences between because the rational map because rational maps have critical points they are not invertible whereas groups are well, they are invertible by definition Mobius maps are invertible so for instance um, if a, if the limit set of a Kleinian group is connected then it's necessarily locally connected but there are many examples of Julia sets that are connected but not locally connected. Um, on the other hand, there's another <clears throat> big difference. It's now known that, known for quite a while now, that um, limit sets of Kleinian groups have zero area, but but there are Julia sets of positive area, and it took quite some work to prove this. <clears throat> okay, um, so with all of this motivation, um, let me now move on to some more sort of down to earth similarities between limit sets and Julia sets. I showed you a few pictures of limit sets and Julia sets early on, but those are just random examples that look similar. But now let's look at some pictures that look so similar that you are tempted to guess that maybe there is a more um, dynamically meaningful connection between these pictures. Maybe there is some way to go from one to the other. So here are some. Um, um, Okay, so there are three rows here. So each of each row shows you the picture of a Kleinian reflection group or the limit set of a Kleinian reflection group. And the, on the right, you have the Julia set of a, of a rational map or an anti-holomorphic rational map actually, because these are Kleinian reflection groups. So the, the analog of reflection groups would be anti-holomorphic rational maps. And you see that um, these, the Julia set here, or, sorry, the, the limit set here is exactly topologically is exactly the same as the uh, as the Julia set over here, and the same is true for all of these examples. But this one is particularly interesting. It's the classical Apollonian gasket, and here is a Julia set realization of the classical Apollonian gasket. So this guy is homeomorphic to that one. Uh, here's just another example. Now, um, to just give some context to these examples. So what we are seeing on the left, all these three pictures, these are uh, limit sets of reflection groups generated by reflections in a circle packing, reflections in the circle of a circle pack, in the circles of a circle packing. So here, um, yeah, this guy is generated by these gray circles. The Apollonian gasket is generated by reflections in these four circles. And the last picture here is generated by reflection in five circles. There is a small one down here. And these guys, there's a reason why we have put two yellow dots here. So this is uh, the Julia set of a cubic anti-holomorphic polynomial. So just a quick reminder that a rational map of, sorry, if the rational map <clears throat> has degree D, 
then it uh, riemann hurbis formula tells us that there are 2d minus 2 critical points of the rational map on the riemann sphere so a cubic polynomial will have well a polynomial has uh, two critical points, the cubic polynomial will have two critical points at infinity, and then there are two finite critical points, and these are the ones, and these are fixed under iteration. So this is a critically fixed polynomial. Um, this Julia set here, it's also the Julia set of a cubic anti-rational map, so there will be four critical points, and these are the four critical points. Again, they're all fixed. And in this picture, this is the Julia set of a degree four anti-rational map. So it's going to have six critical points. And uh, we can see two of them here, but these two are double critical points. So they count for four critical points and there's another double critical point at infinity. So all these are critically fixed anti-rational maps. So these are all reflection groups generated by circles of a circle packing. And these are all critically fixed anti-rational maps. Uh, yeah, so we will just quickly recall. So before I state the first theorem connecting these um, dynamical systems, let's quickly recall that so a circle packing for us is just a finite collection of circles so that the union is connected. And uh, such things can be combinatorially parametrized by a theorem of Kirby and driven first term. So given a circle packing, you can associate to the circle packing, what's called the contact graph of the circle packing. You just put a vertex in each of the circles and connect two vertices if the corresponding circles touch. And clearly these such graphs are going to be connected. If you require the circle packing to be connected, then the contact graph is also connected. It's simple because, well, because these are, it's a circle packing, two circles don't touch at more than one point. And it's a plain graph, it's a planar graph. But it turns out that these are, um, th these restrictions are also sufficient. So given any connected simple plane graph, there is a finite circle packing in the plane. In fact, uh, well, we will be working on the sphere, but yeah, this is stated in the plane. Uh, whose contact graph is isomorphic to gamma. So to be precise, I should, instead of planar, I should say plane here, because if you take a different uh, planar embedding of, so planar just means that the graph is embeddable in the plane, but then depending on how you draw it, uh, they, they may or may not be isomorphic as plane graphs or as fan graphs, but um, here the isomorphism between the contact graph and the, uh, and the given graph gamma is really planar isomorphism. Okay, now um, we don't want to look at arbitrary circle packings. So we are interested in circle packings. Um, I'm sorry. Um, given a circle packing, the group generated by the reflections in the circles of the circle packing P gamma, so you fix a graph gamma, realize it as a circle packing, and look at the Kleinian reflection group generated by reflection uh, in the circles of the circle packing. And such a circle, uh, such a reflection group will be called a kissing reflection group because the circles sort of kiss each other. Um, and we are not going to be interested in uh, reflection groups with disconnected limit sets. So it turns out, I mean, it's a simple combinatorial exercise to check that the limit set of a kissing reflection group G gamma is connected if and only if gamma is two connected. Where two connected means that your, uh, your graph has at least two vertices and the deletion of any vertex along with the, the, edges, adjacent, the edges adjacent to it will not disconnect the graph. So here's an example of a non two connected graph. You delete this and you have a disconnected graph. And you can now convince yourself that this disconnection here of, of, of the vertex, I mean, of the graph is going to give you a disconnection of the limit set. So we are only going to be interested in simple plane two connected graphs, not just one connect. Um, okay. Um, so maybe let me go back to this picture. So there are two questions that you can ask uh, when you look at these similarities. A, whether these things are really homeomorphic and whether there is a reason for them to be homeomorphic. And the other thing is, well, if they're homeomorphic, is it just a topological similarity or is there also a dynamical similarity between these pictures? Meaning, is there any relation between the group action on the, on the limit set here and the rational map action on the Julia set there? Well, firstly, this question is slightly ill-posed because on the left side, you have the action of a group 
And on, uh, and on the other side, you have the action of a semi-group because the ras rational maps are not invertible. But one thing you can ask, well, um, is there a homeomorphism from here to there that at least preserves the grand orbits? So the orb, take any point on the limit set, look at its entire G orbit, and look at the corresponding point on the Julia set, and look at its grand orbit under the rational map, meaning look at the entire forward orbit and and the entire backward orbit of the forward orbit points. So all points that are eventually going to be, you know, uh, X and Y are in the same grand orbit if, if eventually they're going to be mapped to the same point. Uh, so is there a homeomorphism that preserves these grand orbits? Then it's a dynamically meaningful homeomorphism between them. So um, in order to, hmm, to make sense of such a homeomorphism or, or a dynamical link between the group and the polynomial, we are going to extract a single map from a reflection group. So you start with a well connected plain simple graph gamma and let di be the disjoint round disks bounded by the circles of the packet, right? So, so, so like this. And then <laughs> you define the Nielsen map of the group gamma as a map defined on a subset of the Riemann sphere. It's only going to be defined on the closure of the disk. So for instance, if this is your circle packing, then the map N gamma is only going to be defined on the union of these disks. And on each disk, it's just the reflection in the circle. So on, on each disk, it's just reflecting, you're just reflecting by reflecting in, this, in the boundary circle. So this defines, what we call a Nielsen map. In fact, uh, Nielsen himself um, implicitly worked with these kind of maps in the in the holomorphic setting. And it's uh, fairly easy to see that the map n gamma, the Nielsen map of the group, and the group itself have the same grand orbits. So if you pick a point on the limit set, then it's the group orbit is the same as the grand orbit under the Nielsen map. And Here's a fundamental connection between the dynamics of um, a reflection group and the dynamics of a polynomial. So the simplest uh, reflection group is probably the ideal triangle group or well, more generally the ideal, some ideal polygon group. And the simplest anti-holomorphic polynomial is Z bar to the D. Um, a trivial connection between them is that they both have, have the unit circle as their limit and Julia sets respectively. But there's more, there is in fact a dynamical connection between them. And here's the connection. If you look at the I. Sure. Yeah. Just clarification. So yeah. The, yeah. the Nielsen map is necessarily defined for a polygon reflection group, or is it more general? It's for any circle packing. So you take any circle packing. So, for instance, in any of these pictures, you can make sense of the Riemann map. So, of the Nielsen map. So, here you have the Nielsen map defined on these gray disks. Here you have it defined. So, for instance, here you have it defined on the union of the disks bounded by the circle packing. I see. So, so the, the Nielsen map is something on the sphere. On the sphere. It's not. Yes. Yeah, but not on the whole, not on the whole sphere. So it's not defined on the fundamental domain of the reflection group. The, the fundamental domain of the reflection group is roughly the complement of the circle packing, right? There it's not defined. It's only defined on the, on the disks bounded by the circle packing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, as long as your disks don't intersect, you have a definition. You have a well-defined map there. Um, yeah, okay. So yeah, let's just quickly look at the case of the ideal triangle group. And the ideal triangle group is generated by, uh, well, these three circles, I mean, reflections in these three circles. I'm just drawing the part in the unit disk. And if you reflect, um, so let's just look at the, 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 the action of the group on the unit disk, there's a symmetric picture outside. But if you define this map, the Nielsen map, where is it defined? It's gonna be defined here, here, and there. It's not defined on the fundamental domain, as I said, because it's not a part of the, the interior of the circle packing. So here you're reflecting in the red circle, here you're reflecting in the uh, blue circle, and here you're reflecting in the uh, green circle. And clearly this part, of the circle now is going to cover the other two. So it's going to give you a, this dynamics is a very simple um, Markov dynamics, meaning there's a Markov partition and the associated transition matrix is 
this, right? So each piece, this piece is going to cover the other two, this piece is going to cover the other two and so on. And um, so we are in the D equals two case. The corresponding map Z bar squared has exactly the same Markov partition. I mean, it's exactly the same if you choose the, uh, the ideal vertices to be the third, roots of, the third roots of unity. So under Z bar squared, the red covers the blue and green, the blue covers the red and green, and the green covers the red and blue, et cetera. So you have exactly the same Markov partition, and then you can use this fact to find a topological conjugation or a circle homeomorphism that conjugates the Nielsen map of the ideal triangle group to the map Z bar squared. So this, as a first example, this gives you a dynamically meaningful homeomorphism between a limit set and a Julia set, right? So it is the, one question, is the map quasi-symmetric, the conjugacy? No, no, it's not quasi-symmetric. Yeah, that's a good point because these are parabolic fixed points for the group right. and these are repelling. Oh, these are hyperbolic, okay. These yeah. are hyperbolic, yeah. Yeah, okay. it's not a quasi-symmetric conjugation. Well, it's in the class that you study the, I forget the name of that class. No, David, David, David yes. Class. It's yeah, a... these guys the, in the right direction, in this direction, the map has a David extension to the disk. Okay, okay, thanks. Okay, okay now with this background, with the, um, we can now um, talk about a new line in the dictionary or a new um, um, sort of bijection between two different classes of dynamical systems. So, so on one side, you have kissing reflection groups with connected limit set, and the other side, you have critically fixed anti-rational maps and they are in bijective correspondence and they're also parametrized by this combinatorial object, namely a two connected simple plane graph. So um, if I want to be a bit more precise, I can say that this is uh, something with, let's say D plus one vertices. And here these guys are, well, so that means you, if you're, well, okay, one second. I'll, I'll explain this. Oh, sorry. So, okay, so what is this? Um, here I have just written all kissing reflection groups with connected limit set and all critically fixed anti-rational maps. But of course, these are sort of graded by, these are graded by the degree and these are graded by how many circles you have in the circle pattern. And this is just the contact graph. So if you have D plus one vertices, then you have D plus one circles in the packing and the corresponding anti-rational map is going to have degree D, which is uh, consistent with what we saw earlier. If you have three circles in the packing, the corresponding map has degree two. Okay, um, so that's the thing. Um, the leftmost objects are the graphs and the middle objects, well, how are they related? Well. This graph is simply the contact graph of the reflection group or contact graph of the circle packing that defines the reflection group. And uh, now you can ask, how are these two things related? So is there any combinatorial connection between, uh, between the critically fixed anti-rational map and the um, contact graph itself? And the answer is yes, one can associate to every critically fixed anti-rational map. Well, I didn't define the word critically fixed. These are just anti-rational maps that fix all of the critical points point-wise. Um, so given any anti critically fixed anti-rational map, one can associate a combinatorial model to it, which is called the Tischler graph. And that Tischler graph is the planar dual of the contact graph. So this gives you a bijection. And I'll come to the definition of the Tischler graph in a bit. Moreover, um, this is not just a homeomorphism. Well, the, uh, I mean, this bijection is not just at the level of um, combinatorics and contact graphs and planar duals of combinatorial models. There is a dynamically, dynamical connection. Namely, there is a homeomorphism from the limit set of the group to the Julia set of the corresponding anti-rational maps. And it's equivariant in the sense that the homeomorphism conjugates the Nielsen, Nielsen map to the action of the rational map. Okay, so I'll just say a few words on um, how to go from here to there, for instance. So given a rational map or given a Kleinian group, how do you cook up a rational map from it? And um, it essentially uses the notion of the Nielsen map. So before going into the, well, the, the sketch of the proof, 
So here's an example of this correspondence. Here you have a contact graph with five vertices. And this is the corresponding circle packing. You have four circles, one, two, three, four, and a small one down there. And the, the fractal thing is obviously the limit set. And this is the Julia set of the corresponding critically fixed anti-rational map. It's the same uh, one as the one we saw earlier. So this is degree five. This is a, sorry, there are five vertices here. So this is degree four, and you have six critical points, a double critical point here, a double critical point there, and a double critical point at infinity. And maybe this is a good time to sort of at least heuristically or in, uh, um, sort of imprecisely define the Tischler graph. So, so what is a Tischler graph? <clears throat> well, you want to get a combinatorial model for the dynamics of a rational map. And uh, it's a general philosophy that the whole dynamics is kind of dictated by the critical points. If you understand what the critical points do, you more or less understand what the whole rational map does, what the rational map does on the whole sphere. So you look at the critical points and there are three critical points, one here, one here and one at point at infinity. Um, if you have a critical point that is fixed, that means locally, if you write down the power series, it means that locally the map looks like Z bar to the, some power, which means that locally the map is attracting, right? Epsilon goes to epsilon to the K or epsilon bar to the K. So locally the map is attracting. In fact, these are called super attracting because you have, well, anyway, these, these are attracting fixed points. If you have an attracting fixed point, there is a basin of attraction. There are points nearby that are going to be attracted here. So all the critical points have such basins. They are in fact topological disks. If they are topological disks, you can, let's pick say this one, you can uniformize it to a round disk. Since this is a fixed critical point, the rational map is going to preserve this for two component. It takes this for two component, maps it to itself. These are proper maps. If you conjugate the dynamics of the rational map here by the Riemann map, what are you going to get? You are going to get a, you're going to get a proper anti-holomorphic map of a certain degree of the disk. And these are obvious, these are well known to be Blaschke products, but the fact that there's a critical point that is fixed tells you that this map in this particular case is simply z bar to the third, because this is going to be a degree three map here. There is a double critical point. So the conjugated dynamics is simply z bar to the three. So you understand the dynamics on each of the fixed critical for two components. There's a black one containing infinity, and there's a green one, and then there's a blue one. And the dynamics on each of them in this example is exactly z bar to the third. Now z bar to the third has a few interesting radial lines. So on the disk, if you look at the disk, well, um, how does Z bar to the third act on, on the circle? Well, it takes a point e to the i theta, or if you parameterize your circle as theta, it takes a point theta on the circle, sends it to negative three theta, right? So the map is on the circle, just theta going to negative three theta. And there are some fixed angles. There are exactly four fixed angles under this, under this map. These angles are going to give you some fixed radial lines that are, I mean, a, a few radial lines, finitely many radial lines that are exactly fixed or uh, setwise fixed under the map z bar to the third. You pull them back to the for two component and you get a finite collection of rays. These are called rays in a for two component. If you look at all such rays in all the critical, fixed critical uh, for two components, that the collection of these is going to give you a graph, which is called the Tischler graph. Okay, so, um, so that Tischler graph, as you can see here, this Tischler graph is dual to this contact graph. And that's a general theory. Okay, so how do you go from the map to the, or rather the, from the group to the map? Um, roughly speaking, you look at, not the action of the whole group on the sphere, but the action of the Nielsen map on the on wh wherever it's defined. Where is it defined? It's defined on these five circles. Um, in particular, it's not really defined on a whole component on the, of the domain of discontinuity. It's not defined here and there and there. However, 
it's defined on the boundary of a component of the domain of discontinuity. And if you look at it a bit carefully, what's really happening here? It looks as though this is just an ideal quadrilateral group and the dynamics of the Nielsen map on this component is conjugate to the dynamics of the Nielsen map of an ideal quadrilateral group. So just like in the anti-rational setting, we managed to look at the restriction of the rational map on each for two component, you can do the same for the Nielsen map. On each of these components, the Nielsen map has a simpler representative. Namely, it's the Nielsen map of some polygon reflection group. And since, as we mentioned earlier, um, Nielsen maps of ideal polygon groups are topologically conjugate to the Nielsen maps of power maps, you can do a topological surgery to modify the Nielsen maps on these components and glue in the action of suitable powers of Z-bar, suitable power maps. And this is going to give you a branch covering of the Riemann sphere. So the main point was that the Nielsen map was not defined here. And it was non-invertible, and it was invertible, <coughs> sorry, locally. But then you glued in the action of a power map in these components that A, gave you criticality, and B, Extended, extended the Nielsen map or modified the Nielsen map to a branch covering of the whole sphere. And then you appeal to a general theorem of Thurston that I stated, I mean, alluded to earlier, that given a branch covering of the rim of, of the topological two sphere, um, if you check that it satisfies some combinatorial analytic properties, then it can actually be realized as a rational or anti-rational map. And that's how you go from the Yes. Just one more thing. Uh, what was the domain of definition of the Nielsen map in this picture, in the G gamma picture again? I and mean, could you just enlarge yeah, yeah. that picture one more time? Yeah. Just, just, yes, right. I'll, I'll, I'll drive. Yeah. One second. It's this circle. Yes. And These are the circles a, of the circle packing, and there's a yeah. fifth one here. Yes. And it's defined. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So where are you doing the surgery? And mm. the you're doing the surgery on a... So you're first going to look at uh, the fundamental domain of the group. And the do fundamental domain of the group is this polygon, this quadrilateral, yeah. this quadrilateral, and that quadrilateral. Then you want to look at those yeah. components of the domain of discontinuity. You look at the components of the domain of discontinuity containing the, um, the fundamental domain. And that's um, where you're going to do. Yeah. Yeah. Just one moment. So this is a disconnected. I mean, these are one, two, three uh, fundamental domains, right? I mean, this is supposed to be on the sphere, correct? That's correct. Yeah, it's a disconnected fundamental. So there, domain. there are three components, right? So there are three uh, components. Yeah. Okay. There are th and, mm -hmm. yeah. and where are you doing the surgery? Are you doing the surgery on the on each of the components of the domain of discontinuity? Exactly, exactly. There are three components of the domain of discontinuity. One uh, like this, one like that, and there's a, there's the one outside. Like, uh, some, yeah, well, whatever, yeah, the outer we, boundary. We make it look very bad. Yeah, okay, fine. Sorry, yeah, okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah um, so these are the three components of the domain of discontinuity where you're going to do the surgery. And on each of them, you're going to glue in what you yeah. have on the right side, namely here, you're so, going to glue in yeah, a Z-bar. Yeah, that's fine. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's fine. But the thing is, you started off with a reflection map. And so there is no, no germ of that reflection map left after the surgery. There is, the, there is, there is. Um, you're only going to introduce the Z-bar to the third map on the three components of the domain of discontinuity. Elsewhere, it's the oh, in particular on the Julia set. Sorry, on the limit set, you have not changed yes. the map. Yes, you, you have not changed the map on the limit set, and there are all the little islands on which you have left the. Yeah, stuff at the yeah, yeah, yeah. All the other bubbles are untouched. I see. I see. I see. Okay. 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 Yeah. I see. Yeah, but uh, yeah. So I think the the thing that bothering me is that in a germ of a neighborhood of the limit set 
inside one of the components of the domain of discontinuity, you had you started off with a Nielsen map. I mean, there was some part of the Nielsen map defined inside there, namely on some fundamental domain, right? Outside or, the fundamental domain. Outside yeah. the fundamental domain. But yeah. that that has been thrown out, and you have glued in uh, this uh, either zebra cube dot. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So here you have really changed the dynamics, and the dynamics was defined here. You have modified that. Uh -huh. Uh, I see, I see, I see. Okay, so okay, this, okay. yeah, yeah. This dynamics is not compatible with that dynamics. I mean, Zbar to the K dynamics is not, com not. I mean, it's only compatible with the dynamics of the Nielsen map on the boundary circle. Inside, right. there are different dynamics. I mean, here you have a tiling structure. You don't really have that here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fine. fine. Wait okay. one second. Uh, that yeah. Zbar <laughs> to the cube which you're gluing in. Hmm. Are you gluing that using the Riemann mapping or using your David homeomorphism? Ah, so right now I'm doing it just topologically. So I'm just going to get a branched cover. Right, but you said, uh, okay, fine. Yeah, yeah, okay, that's a good point. If you want to go from the group I to mean, the rational map. You said you're not changing the map on the limit set, right? So you're not changing, yeah. So if you want to do that, then you can't use the Riemann map. You have to use the David map, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, okay, no, one second. So um, if I want to change, well, okay. So I know that this guy, so this far, guy and I, yeah. So far you are just doing a, a map on a circle, right? So this is a topological conjugacy that you have constructed. Yeah, yeah, okay. So yeah, exactly, exactly. So I'll, I'll say maybe. So yeah, there is a, these are all topological disks. So there is a, this is, a, there's a topological disk and a Riemann map here, and a topological disk, and a Riemann map there. This dynamics is going to be uh, some neat ideal polygon Nielsen map. This is going to be some Z bar to the third acting here. And I know there is a conjugation between these two from this circle to that circle, some conjugation. Um, and uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm not, not going to change the dynamics on the circle at all. Um, so yeah, what's the formula that we want? I mean, essentially something like you go from, well, firstly, you, sorry, you have the Z bar to the third here. Under Zeta, you pull it back to some map here. That's the thing. Zeta is a conjugation between, yeah, this is what I wanted to say, between the Nielsen map and the Z bar to the third map. Zeta is a conjugation. So here, I'm going to define the map Zeta, Z bar to the third, Zeta inverse. And this map agrees with the Nielsen map on the boundary because of conjugation, but it's topologically Z bar to the third inside. And then I'm going to put this thing here using the Riemann map. That's it. Okay, okay. Yeah. I'm just, I mean, to, to, to sort of import the Z bar to the third dynamics here without altering the boundary dynamics, I'm using the fact that this is a conjugation. Yeah, but I mean, you need to extend zeta to the disk, right? From oh, the, just take, oh yeah, you're right. Of course, sorry, I should have said that. Take any extension. I just any want extension. to It's just a topological extension. Just right. a topological extension. Yeah, I should have said okay. that, yeah. Right, right. Just okay. any topological extension. Okay, so that gives you a way to go from groups to anti-rational maps. So, uh, just a question, uh, Shobhav. Yeah. So, um, yeah. so to get, get the actual polynomial on the right, you need some kind of uh, like measurable Riemann mapping sort of thing to get it or? or what yeah, so this is not exactly going to be a measurable Riemann mapping. The, okay. Here we are going to use the Thurston's realization theorem. What it does is oh, it I takes <clears throat> the action of the branched cover on the sphere minus some distinguished points, namely the critical points here. I see. And yeah. Yeah, so I mean, it is roughly speaking that. So what you're, but, but what, essentially what you're gonna do is you want to endow this particular punctured sphere with a complex structure that makes the branch cover holomorphic. Ah, I see, okay, right. That, that's the so, fixed point and so that's on. That's the iteration on the tight space and finding the fixed point. Uh, I see, okay. And and it's sort of, uh, I guess, I mean, Thurston had this obstruction, right? So right. So you have vanishes to check that, over here, then that's easy to see, is it? It's not easy, it requires okay. some work. Uh, yeah. I it's okay. in fact, I mean, people say it's never easy to see that the first uh, obstructions don't exist. But okay. yeah, but there are some theorems, uh, especially due to uh, the one that we use here. It's, it's a very useful uh, theorem by Kevin Pilgrim and Tanle. They sort of bring it down to 
because the Thurston obstruction is an infinite obstruction. I mean, there are infinitely many candidates for the obstruction. Um, right. So there is no nice algorithm to check that there is no such Thurston obstruction, but they can bring it down to some uh, checkable finite class. I see. Okay, thanks. But, I mean, this is a Thurston theorem for anti-holomorphic maps. Yeah. Right, so you it's take a slight second, extension of Thurston's theorem. That's true. It's a slight extension. Essentially, you can pass to the second iterate, and then you can check that if the I see, I see. Yeah, second iterate, the second is, yeah. iterate right. Yeah, that's how you can do it. Okay. Okay, uh, I'll just skip this slide in the interest of time. Um, but okay, so we have this dictionary between graphs and groups and anti rational maps. If you put certain qualifiers on the graphs, then um, you get nice properties. On the rational map and the and the uh, uh, sorry, Shopa, just one last question. Yeah, uh, the the Tischler graph is there a realization theorem for that? Yeah. Oh, I yeah. So I didn't complete the proof here in order to prove that. I mean, given a if you start from the right hand side, given a Tischler graph, can yeah. you find a, a anti rational map? Pretty yeah. Right. So what we have proved is that. Given any two connected simple plane graph, there is a group, there's a circle packing, and hence there is a group. And from there, you can go there to, to. So, this construction that I just discussed, it constructs for you a critically fixed anti rational map whose Tischler graph is the dual of gamma. I see. So, given the Tischler graph, you look at its dual, then you construct the Kleinian group, then you construct R. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Okay, got you. And to okay. say that these are all critically fixed anti rational maps, um, that, that's more complex dynamics. You just have to say that, I mean, you have to prove that the Tischler graph of every critically fixed anti rational map uh, has such and such properties that, you know, faces are Jordan domains, et cetera, et cetera, so okay. that you finally conclude that the dual has this property. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah, so one thing that's probably important for the theorems that I'm going to state now, um, in particular, if you're gamma, which is already assumed to be a simple plane two connected graph, if it's also three connected, meaning uh, equivalently, if it's the one skeleton of a convex polyhedron, then um, the corresponding group has a gasket limit set like here. And also the corresponding Julia set has a, I mean, the corresponding rational map has a gasket Julia set. So at the level of fractal similarities, this is something. However, we'll soon see that this polyhedral or three connected condition has a deeper implication. Okay, now, uh, so, so far we were talking about how to connect these dynamical systems. Now we are going to, well, whatever in whatever time is remaining, we are going to talk about the deformation spaces of these dynamical systems. So what do I mean? Um, given a group, uh, given a graph gamma, Two connected plane simple. I'm not going to repeat the, these qualifiers, uh, plane simple and two connected, but all graphs gamma are going to be simple plane and two connected. So given such a thing, you look at all possible kissing Klein and reflection groups that are quasi-conformally conjugate to this guy. So that gives you the quasi-conformal deformation space of, um, of the group G gamma. And this just essentially means that instead of a given circle packing, you choose a different circle packing with the same contact graph. Or in other words, it means that uh, you are changing the, so for instance, if we go back to our previous picture, it just means that you are changing the moduli of all of these rectangles here. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's the simple definition. This is the quasi conformal deformation space of the group. There's a similar deformation space for, um, for a rational map. So since the map ration, the map R gamma, has a fixed critical point, you cannot quite quasi conformally deform it because a, a critical point being fixed under the dynamics is a rigid con condition. I mean, if you write down uh, this as an algebraic equation, you are only going to get um, finite many solutions. So there are, given in a certain degree, in a given degree, there are only finitely many maps with all critical points fixed. So you can't quasi conformally deform the, that dynamics globally. But you can talk about the space of anti-rational maps whose Julia sets uh, or whose Julia dynamics, namely the dynamics of uh, any map over here on its Julia set is going to be quasi conformally conjugate to the dynamics of the base point of the critically fixed anti-rational maps. And this is known as the hyperbolic component of, of the map R gamma. Okay, so essentially, 
These are quasi-conformal deformation spaces. Here you can take the quasi-conformal deformation on the whole sphere, but here you have to restrict to quasi-conformal deformation only on the Julian set. However, it turns out that the hyperbolic component is not quite the right analog of the quasi-conformal deformation space in this setting. And there are two reasons. One is that, one is the reason that King Shuddha pointed out that these maps, these groups have parabolic fixed points. And when you deform something quasi-conformally, parabolics remain parabolic. So you're not changing the, you are not changing the derivatives at the fixed points. However, these guys have repelling or hyperbolic fixed points um, so what are the fixed points? Maybe I'll just show a picture. Uh, so the parabolic fixed points in this setting are precisely the points of tangency of the circle, like whatever points of tangency you have. And since we have a dynamical uh, or an equivariant map from here to there, these points correspond to fixed points of the rational map. But these fixed points are repelling. So that's a, a sort of a minor inconsistency. And the problem with this inconsistency is that when you quasi-conformally deform the map R gamma, your repelling or hyperbolic fixed points, their derivatives can grow in an uncontrolled fashion. And if it grows in an uncontrolled fashion, um, th there are problems. You, you get a more nasty space that you can't quite control. So that's one heuristic reason why instead of looking at the entire hyperbolic component, we only look at this relative hyperbolic component of the critically fixed anti-rational map, which consists of the sub, which is essentially the subspace of the whole hyperbolic component where your uh, fixed points have a uniformly bounded derivative. So it's, uh, one can think of this as some kind of an analog of a paired deformation space or, a, well, so, um, Anyway, maybe the, I mean, is it the analog of the Kleinian deformation space where the parabolics are fixed? As yeah, this is that's exactly saying. So here you have to deform the manifold as a paired manifold. So right, so parabolics have to be fixed, and the analog of that here is that you don't want your repelling fixed uh, repelling multipliers to grow to infinity. That's the analog. So that's the moral analog, and now we will see that there is actually a good reason why this should be the right analog, why this, this relative deformation space should be the right analog of the quasi-conformal deformation space. Okay, so coming back to, um, the, to the polyhedral graphs, so we saw that the graph is polyhedral if and only if the corresponding Julia and limit sets are gaskets, but more importantly, one can show that the contact graph gamma is polyhedral if and only if the associated three manifold of the reflection group here, of course, I'm cheating a little bit. What I mean is the three manifold of the index two Kleinian subgroup of the reflection group. Um, that is acylindrical. Where, well, maybe I'll not define acylindrical because I don't really have much time. Um, yeah, so this is a geometric characterization. The, uh, the, the graph being polyhedral is equivalent to the corresponding three manifold being acylindrical. And, the Thurston's compactness theorem tells us that in this particular setting, well, since, um, sorry, Thurston's compactness theorem tells us that um, the paired deformation space or the deformation space of a paired, of a paired three manifold um, is pre compact, provided the corresponding three manifold is acylindrical. So then you ask whether there's an analog of this theorem in the case of anti-rational maps. Namely, if the graph gamma is polyhedral, because this is what gives you acylindricity and hence boundedness in the parameter space, will gamma acylindrical, uh, gamma polyhedral going to give you boundedness of the corresponding relative deformation spaces? And it turns out to be true. Uh, one more reason why this is the correct thing to look at is that the actual hyperbolic component, the entire thing where you do not have an upper bound on the derivative at the fixed points, that's never bounded. So with this relative deformation space, um, you have an exact analog of Thurston compactness theorem. Uh, yeah, I'll just state the other results. There are more parallel results, uh, sort of parallels between the deformation spaces of uh, these kissing reflection groups and anti-holomorphic critically fixed anti holomorphic rational maps. Namely, um, if you draw a circle packing like this, sorry, I wanted to draw the circle packing of the ideal quadrilateral group. So this is an ideal quadrilateral group, or rather 
uh, a circle packing that gives rise to, uh, I mean, its limit set is obviously this. So this reflection group is the ideal quadrilateral group and the contact graph you can clearly see is, uh, is just a, is this thing. Yeah? Now, if you want to pinch a curve, if you want to pinch um, a curve on the quotient three manifold or rather the conformal boundary of the uh, quotient three manifold that would correspond to say bringing these two circles closer and then you're going to get a picture like this. So you can quasi conformally deform the original graph and pass to um, some other group whose contact graph is strictly larger than the contact graph of this in the sense that there is a copy of this contact graph sitting here. You're just adding more edges. So um, in the group setting, you have the hyperbolization theorem to tell you that given two or given a pair of two connected simple plane graphs, gamma and gamma prime, the quasi conformal deformation space of G gamma prime, it's like there's like a strata structure, right? So um, the, the quasi conformal deformation space of the group G gamma prime is completely contained in the boundary of the quasi conformal deformation space of G gamma, if and only if you have such a domination relation. It's easy to see in the group setting. It turns out there is exactly an, there's an exact analog in the rational map setting as well. So a hyperbolic component or a relative hyperbolic component of the critically fixed anti-rational map R gamma bifurcates to the hyperbolic relative hyperbolic component of some R gamma prime, another critically fixed anti-rational map, if and only if you have a similar domination relation. So here I have used the word bifurcation as opposed to this um, containment because here the quasi conformal deformation spaces have different dimension. You really have a low dimensional simplex sitting on the boundary of a uh, high, higher dimensional simplex. But in the rational map setting, all the hyperbolic components are actually of the same complex dimension. There are like some simply connected, um, simply connected domains in, in some CD or whatever, some CN. Um, and it, something bifurcating to something else should be thought of as one bulb here, another bulb there, and they touch at some point or touch at some, um, in this case, some sub variety. Anyway, okay, so this gives you another relation. There's an exact parallel between how these deformation spaces interact. Uh, do I have two more minutes to? Sure, sure. Huh? Okay. Then you want to say something about the global topology of these deformation spaces. So there is an um, unpublished preprint by Hatcher and Thurston, where they look at the space of marked circle packings, and they prove that the natural map from the space of marked circle packings with a given number of circles to the configuration space of um, the same number of marked points in the plane, which just sends the circles to their centers is a homotopy equivalence. So the, in particular, the pi one of this is going to be the same as the pi one of that. And the pi one of this, because I have marking, I mean, because they work with marked points, is the pure braid group. Um, we want a similar statement in our setting. Meaning, if I look at the collection of all the relative hyperbolic components, you have fixed a degree and look at all possible critically fixed anti-rational maps, look at their relative hyperbolic components and take the union also with the closure. What kind of a space is it? One can show it's a path connected space, but what about the global topology? Is there any trivial, non-trivial global topology? And it turns out that this is indeed, indeed the case. Uh, there's actually a surjective homeomorphism from the fundamental group of the union of the closure of all of these relative hyperbolic components to the mapping class group of a punctured sphere. I'll just say a word, why is, uh, are these two things related? It's related because the pi one of this, as I said, is the pure braid group. And if you forget the marking up to the action of a symmetric group, it's the braid group, which is the mapping class group of a punctured disk. And why do they have disk and why do we have a sphere? Because they're only going, they're only working with circle packings in the plane. So the mapping classes in the plane preserve infinity. That's why you get mapping classes in of a punctured disk. In our case, we are working with some uh, mapping um, circle packings on the whole sphere, rational maps acting on the whole sphere. So you have to look at 
um, the mapping class group of a punctured sphere. Okay, so, so there is a similar um, topological, uh, not non-trivial global topology in this particular hyperbolic component. And this, I mean, this is something that you do not see in low dimensional parameter spaces of rational maps, but in high dimension you have. And yeah, just a remark that we actually do not have any idea about the kernel of this thing. So whether, I mean, this is a much stronger statement that they prove, but in the rational map setting, we don't know anything more than this. Uh, all right, I should stop here. I have no time to talk about proofs, so thank you. Uh, thank you, Subhashi, for beautiful talks. Let us thank the speaker. Uh, I think we can still take one or two questions. So if anybody wants to ask a question, please unmute yourself and ask Subhashi. Yeah, Shubhu, so can you go back to that compactness uh, slide? Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, so the, the relative thing, so a, the way I think this Thurston compactness theorem is proven is that you can't open up a cusp in the, mm. uh, right? Um, yeah. And so uh, this boundedness is with respect to some, uh, I mean, so for each uniform bound on the growth, there is a, I mean, the, the, the way it's quantified is what I'm asking. I mean, on one side, here you are, you, you are really, are you, if you declare a, a uniform upper bound, then. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Is, here yeah. we declare. So, so the correct statement, and I didn't want to make it so technical, but the point is, the real statement is, you're looking at H R gamma comma K. Where ah, this yeah. is uh, so yeah. K is the uh, uniform upper bound on the on the well the um, the derivative of the, the hyperbolic, hyperbolic expansion constant. Yes. Yeah. 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 There is a global upper bound on the hyperbolic expansion constant K. So once you fix K, this is going to be bounded. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. And I mean, there is some similar. Well, Wait, one second. Uh, yeah. Bounded me as a subset of some CN, is it? Uh, no, it, it's right. It, it's it's bounded in the space of rad D, the space of all degree D rational maps. Like here, you your ambient space is let's say the, the whole uh, space of representations. You want your representations to converge to something. Here, you want a, you take a sequence in this relative hyperbolic component, and it's possible that the hyperbolic uh, this sequence has no limit in the whole space of degree D rational maps. Oh. Okay. Right? Yeah. So we proved that, in fact, yeah, um, given any sequence, there's a subsequence that converges to a rational map of the same degree. Okay. Uh, just a quick question uh, about uh, this. I think it's maybe it's related to this as well, and also the global topology. So, in, in, uh, for this uh, Thurston's side of things, so there is also this uh, phenomenon of these components, uh, the closures bumping into each other, right? Ah. So like uh, mm. uh, themselves. Yeah. So is, is that a feature you expect to see here as well, or is doesn't occur for yeah. these specific things? No, it, it does, it does. Okay, so maybe I'll say, so in the global topology, how do you get global topology, roughly speaking? Because you have hyperbolic components uh, that have, Mm -hmm. You have different accesses, different ways of going from one hyperbolic component to another hyperbolic component. And that's what gives you the global topology. So, mm -hmm. um, so the, the, there are loops, yeah, these loops. And you, so the, yeah, what is the monodromy represent? Maybe I'll not get into that. But yeah, these are the loops that give you um, a non trivial homomorphism. You're going to follow something, right? You are going to look at the mapping class group as a braid group. You're going to follow the, um, Essentially, in this case, you're going to follow. Um, you're going to follow the critical points, right? The you're going to follow points. the critical points. Yeah. 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 I see. I see. Okay. okay. Yeah. And the self bumping, um, we actually have something very similar to self bumping, but the problem is that uh, we have a situation like this where, you know, we have, well, okay, I'll not draw a picture. The point is, in order to have a self bumping, you need like an axis from the hyperbolic component. Um, let's see, how do I draw this? Something like this, right? So you have a, an axis going here, an axis going there with the same limit point. 
Mm. But rational maps are often not rigid. So we do have two axes. We do have multiple axes to the boundary of the same hyperbolic component. And we mm. believe that these axes should have the same accumulation point or common accumulation points. But because of the, uh, the anti-holomorphicity of the setting, sometimes uh, it's hard to prove that a given curve lands because you sometimes have I mean, maybe I'm answering, the, making it complicated for you. What I mean is that we have two different axes. We just want them to land at the same point, and we do not know how to prove that they land at the same point. If they did, you would get a self pump. But right now, you have a blown up self pump in some sense. Hmm. Okay, I see. Okay. And just uh, one last question: Your definition of H R gamma, uh, the quasi-conformal conjugacy is on the. On the Julia set only, you said, right? Yeah, uh, this is actually so just the hyperbolic component. Uh, yeah, so whose Julia dynamics is QC conjugate to R gamma? What do you mean by QC conjugate on the Julia set? Ah, so I mean, there is a global quasi conformal homeomorphism, which, um, which takes the Julia set up. So there is I see. R which, yeah. Achha, achha. Yeah, which restricts uh, the conjugacy on the Julia sets. Oh, I see. So it doesn't conjugate everywhere, just on the Julia set. Yeah, right. Because okay. uh, if you have some other point in the hyperbolic component, uh, your critical point will no longer be fixed. Um, it'll probably degenerate or do something. You'll just have some linearly attracting point in the hyperbolic component. Instead of super attracting. Instead right. of super attracting. Yeah. I see. I see. Okay. 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 Oh, I see. I see. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay, if, uh, Stop there no, if there are no more questions, let us uh, thank our speaker again for a wonderful talk.